this other ion is sodium, since if its concentration in the external solution was lowered, the action potential immediately became smaller, by an amount depending on the sodium concentration. If, as these experiments suggest, the action potential was dependent on the passage of ions across the membrane, it was obviously important to measure the currents carried by these ions. To do this, it is necessary to hold the internal potential at a chosen value. This is the powerful voltage clamp technique originally developed by Cole in America and applied by Hodgkin, Huxley and Katz. This technique requires that an extra electrode, the current electrode, be inserted into the axon. For this purpose a double electrode was made by winding very fine silver wires around a thin glass capillary. As the wire which was only 20 microns in diameter, was wound on, it was kept taut, as Sir Alan Hodgkin shows, by dangling a small piece of plasticine on the free end. The finished electrode consists of two entirely separate spirals, insulated where necessary by shellac varnish. While it is inserted in the same way as the simple electrode, the information it gives is quite different. As a change of potential is imposed on the axon, as seen in the top trace, the currents flowing across the membrane are revealed in the bottom trace. As the membrane is clamped by successively larger voltage pulses, so the direction of the currents across the membrane changes. The early downward dip, seen on the left, is the transient current carried by the influx of sodium ions. And it is superseded by an opposite and persistent current attributed to the outward flow of potassium ions. This suggestion was later confirmed by changing the potassium concentration within the fibre. In 1956, Hodgkin and Keynes made a micro-injector which could be inserted down the axon in the same way as the simple electrode. During tests, repeated here by Professor Keynes, the fine glass capillary contained a column of dye a few millimetres long. The syringe was mounted so that during injection, the barrel moved over the stationary plunger. Thus the capillary withdraws, leaving the injected solution behind. Of course, during an experiment, the solution was colourless, so its limits were marked by two small bubbles. This technique has proved particularly useful when used with radioactive isotopes. As Dr. Caldwell demonstrates, the external solution was sampled at known times after the injection of the isotope and its activity measured. These experiments showed the presence of a sodium pump in the membrane of the giant axon. This maintains the difference between the internal and external sodium concentrations and is driven by the breakdown of energy-rich phosphate. But the micro-injection technique could only add substances to the axoplasm. There was no opportunity of removing them. In 1961, Baker, Hodgkin and Shaw succeeded in doing just this. In this short sequence, made at the time, Professor Shaw shows how, with a device rather like a miniature garden roller, the axoplasm was gradually squeezed out. An uncleaned axon was used so that the small fibres surrounding it would give the membrane some protection. It was then possible to reinflate the axon by forcing an artificial solution through it, using, in these early experiments, an old gramophone motor connected through gears to a caliper syringe. During the rolling out process, 
some of the axoplasm is forced back up into the tip of the cannula. As the pressure builds up, this is forced out of the cannula and travels down the length of the axon as a small plug until finally ejected. The lumen of the axon is now completely clear and solutions flow through it with ease. Previously, such an isolated membrane was thought to be completely dead. However, the striking fact was that this supposedly lifeless tissue still displayed all the essential behavior of a living nerve. It could still conduct up to half a million impulses, even though large volumes of artificial solutions were streamed through it. This cannulated and perfused axon can, of course, be treated in exactly the same way as an intact one. A simple internal electrode will, as before, give the resting potential. Here, about 80 millivolts. But now, unlike the earlier experiments, it is a simple matter to change the internal solution. If the new solution, which rapidly displaces the old, contains little potassium, a sudden change occurs. The resting potential drops to a small fraction of its former value. It is equally simple to replace the original solution and to restore the resting potential. The resting potential, therefore, depends on the high internal concentration of potassium ions. This surprising technique, then, has been extremely successful. But about the same time, Dr. Tasaki and his colleagues found that they could drill out a central core of axoplasm. Their technique, which is very different to those previously used at Plymouth, is rather less drastic, so that a cleaned axon can be used. The axon is laid out horizontally in a pool of liquid and held in place by a thread attached at each end. When the position of the axon is correct, the usual small notch is cut in it to receive the cannula. In this method, the cannula has to be guided along the whole length of the axon without damaging the membrane, and the double image technique is again used, but with a prism instead of a mirror. The cannula itself is a long, thin glass tube, which, during its passage along the axon, removes the central core of axoplasm. This is achieved by the experimenter, here John Kimura, gently sucking on the cannula so that as it passes down the axon, axoplasm is drawn into it. Another notch is cut in the far end and the cannula passed through it. A positive pressure is now applied to the perfusion liquid within the cannula and the viscous axoplasm rinsed out. The internal electrode, which is on exactly the same axis, is now brought up and its tip inserted into the end of the cannula. While the electrode is within the cannula, both are moved in unison to the middle of the axon. Here, the internal electrode remains, but the cannula is brought back to its starting point and secured with thread. All that remains now is to remove the prism and to bring into position the external electrodes. The particular value of this elaborate and powerful technique is that it permits a cleaned axon to be perfused. It is one of the many techniques which physiologists have developed since the importance of research on the squid's giant axon was first recognized some 40 years ago.
Since then, many scientists from many parts of the world have become deeply involved in its study. The results of their work have greatly increased our understanding of the mechanism of nervous conduction not only in the squid, but in every animal, including man. But as the autumn days draw in, the laboratory ships still return with their cargoes of squid, for many problems remain. How, for instance, does the membrane distinguish between different ions? And what is the mechanism which brings about the changes in permeability? Every winter, therefore, in fair weather or foul, the work of the ships and their crews continues, for the squid giant axon has still much to teach us. Small wonder, then, that each day's haul is eagerly awaited. That results are discussed and experiments made, often far into the night, for this is the work which has provided the basis for modern neurophysiology. At marine laboratories like those at Plymouth in England and Woods Hole in America, the squid, therefore, is a very important animal.